So, does anybody recognize this? Because I would be shocked if anybody does. Really? Do you? Huh? Yes, for sure that. <laughs> and the character? Huh? So, this guy was named Clayman, uh, a genius in claymation back in the day called Doug Tenapple. He did Earthworm Jim and then followed on with the Neverhood, Skull Monkeys, and this is the original Clayman. So the only reason I used that as an opening slide was, yes, the Vitruvian man, the perfect human, and we're going to dispel that myth today, what the perfect human is and how we engage in our environment. Um, and always, always. Okay, so I'm going to do a little brief. This Lakota, the Gone. Um, okay, so a little bit about me. So I was a happy classical painter and became a muralist and went into industrial design with a focus on glass architecture before I got into this world 20 years ago in digital. And I was up in the Bay Area, I was at Dale Chabuli School, and I had a friend of mine down here, I grew up here in LA, who said, Kathleen, you need to get on the box. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? And this was back in 94, 95 days. And actually, either in this building or next door was SGI, Silicon Graphics. So I started my first animation course being an animator at SGI. Was this the original Bay, Baywatch building production facility? Because that's where SGI was. It's possible. Awesome. Anyway, so it all happened right here. And um, I was sold, and I immediately was able to see how my creativity would lead to yet another generation of incarnations, of many incarnations. So I came out as an animator, and luck would have it. I got hired in at DreamWorks know, interactive is, I don't know, maybe employee 40 maybe at the time, that's what it was. And um, guess what? It was a hardcore video game company that was, you know, back-ended by EA and Microsoft, and it wasn't a place where I was going to be game designing like Chris, and my animation skills needed to actually get better, so I became a localization producer. So all of a sudden I was shipped abroad, now it's looking at video game titles, you know, looking at NTSC to PAL, looking at the cultural literacies, and had a, having a different view into video games. So glass blower, animator, video games, like in a year and a half. So from that, went on to IBM Innovation, then went on to Disney, and that was sort of the arc of my career, which ultimately, after you know, 21, 22 years, what's the umbrella? It's experience strategy and experience design at this point. I've kind of touched all parts of the entire life cycle. So you get to a point where my arc and the industry arc has been in parallel. So it's a kind of perfect place to have a global discussion around what experience strategy is. So. OK, uh, I'm not going to repeat any of that. But it's, it's sort of irrelevant. I've been a game designer my whole life, essentially. I just didn't know it. Um, I was a third year freshman at UCLA when I decided to drop out. Um, actually, I didn't decide to drop out. I had five friends stop me mid sense ago. Go make videos. <laughs> and I went, what? So I put together a crappy resume, uh, sent it off to four different companies, and I stayed persistent with one uh, without being a jerk, uh, and got hired in as a tester on the ground floor. It was 1990, end of 94, beginning of 95. I started work as a tester at Blizzard. Uh, some people will probably recognize that. So I was employee 50 in that incarnation of Blizzard. Uh, it existed as a few things before that. Uh, worked on the end of Warcraft 2. Uh, a little bit of, of well, actually most of Diablo and a little bit of um, StarCraft when it was still works in space. Uh, and then I went from there, I did uh, a short stint at another company, nameless, it was less than three months, so screw them. And then from there I got hired into DreamWorks because of my RTS experience to work on, uh, actually we'll cover this a little bit later, right? Okay, uh, to work on games there and then I made the jump into game design um, and at that time I met Kathleen. Um, and that was a pretty magical incubator at the 1996, 1997. A lot of talent in that building, um, you know, and, and that, like, I've been uh, let down ever since just a little bit that, no, that nowhere else in the world is just like it. <laughs> I don't know if it was a time in our life or if it was actually that oh, magical. It was like this bubble of like 20 somethings to early 30 somethings that were given big budgets and like. Yeah. A little bit of freedom to, to, to make mistakes. Um, but it, it was also less risk averse at that time, a little bit. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Medal of Honor came about. Uh, I moved on to that as a lead game designer. Uh, that product started out as, well, the original incarnation for that team was a Jurassic Park game. Uh, Steven Spielberg came in and he said, um, Jurassic Park, that's a dead license. Forget that. You know what I'm doing right now? I'm doing a World War II movie. You guys should do GoldenEye 
World War II, because GoldenEye is awesome. He did play a lot of games at the time. His son, Max, who is also a game designer now, um, uh, influenced his product. And we said, oh my god, a first person shooter on a PlayStation 1? Impossible. And then we went and solved that problem. So, uh, and then that turned into us getting bought by Electronic Arts. We moved into making it into a franchise. Uh, and then we can talk about the sins of large companies as well, if you'd like to, in the Q&A area. Um, <laughs> they all make their own mistakes. So uh, then it went into a product-based product learning. And I, actually, if you talk to people in video games, basically you can ask them which finishing school they went to. EA, Activision, Ubisoft, or uh, who, else, who else would be big enough to do it? Maybe 2K. Um, but the, the, the production philosophies are all a little bit different in the way they operate. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I wandered through Hollywood for a little bit, made a lot of vaporware. Uh, and then uh, I'm independent and now teaching um, at a local university near where I live, but I'm also uh, consulting on various projects. Uh, and somehow that's working, uh, mostly because one of the biggest sins of large tech companies is uh, ageism. I got aged out, and I'm expensive, <laughs> right? So, uh, but th what that does is it, it removes mentors for the younger generation. And so uh, they're solving the same problems with slightly different tech. So. Uh, one of the projects Chris and I worked on at the beginning of the year was for the U.S. Department of Education, which was a platform we created called Raptitude. It was a VR aptitude testing platform with the idea of doing career and college readiness for socioeconomic, socioeconomic challenged high schoolers who actually can't get access to touring universities or don't know how to match their skill set to what university. So unfortunately, we didn't win to move on to the next round, but you know, it's still it's still on the back burner. Hopefully, yeah. we can like you know, turn that one up. But that was yeah. uh, just this past year we worked on a project together. Um, so I'm just going to tee up one thing I mentioned before, which was, is everybody familiar with experience design separate than UX, UI, user experience? Is there a show of hands here, experience designers? Actually, let me take one step back. Who is actually in the room? So if you're a gamer, will you raise your hand? Right on. And if you're in product school and you're looking to become or are a PM, Cool. Okay, uh, UX, any UX? Okay, so all you UXers, I'll be pointing at you. <laughs> um, uh, business, interest, outside, other, somewhere in between. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so experience design has been an interesting word, an interesting buzzword. So I came by it naturally understanding it because I came out of Disney after DreamWorks. So after we launched DisneyWorld.com, we were given the opportunity to think about re-architecting Epcot with new technology. And today, if you've been to uh, Orlando, I don't think it's actually launched here, maybe, is the My Magic Plus wearable device, which, if you're familiar with it, is four RFID chips, one near field communication device in a wearable that promises a seamless experience. So it's your fast pass, your room key, your reservation system, it's a personalization GPS tracker, it's all of that. But everybody that's actually used it and invested the hour plus prior getting to Disney to program you know, your favorites, it's been a payoff. I haven't heard any negative feedback. So when they asked us to re-architect Epcot with new technology, that's what came of it. I didn't work on that project, but I was at the first round table meeting of what does that look like? And at that point, it was a lot of, well, this is a lot of data, and this is a lot of mining data, and this is a long-term relationship and a big CRM that Disney's gonna have with its customer base, and I don't know if that's scary or if I don't, I don't know if I wanna be here for 20 years doing it, but the point is, Experience design from Disney was all about the best storytelling and was a traditional talk about it. But I just wanted to sort of re-emphasize experience design when you use that phrase today, uh, in two weeks, my industry, theme park development, which is a lot of what I do currently today, is all meeting for their annual conference. And a lot of people consider themselves experience designers. So it's themed entertainment that kind of own that title. And we'll go through the arc of when that sort of shifted to UX, UI. But experience design typically from my world, how I was taught, was theme park development, or family entertainment centers, or some kind of interaction between your physical space and everything around you. So go ahead and answer that question. <laughs> well, actually, I'll jump right off of like experience design. So what's interesting is I think of every game product that I work on as an experience. Uh, and it starts with, and it used to start with the box. 
right? And then it went to, you know, like first screen, intro, how you pace everything, how you, how you draw the, the people into the experience uh, for, you know, maximum enjoyability and endorphin release. So, um, but uh, the, getting back to it, part of that actually endorphin release is actually really important here. So uh, what's significant about this slide is uh, not that it's uh, cool cookie pictures or whatever, but uh, basically how this relates to game design is whatever skill that you have, if you can score it, you can game it, right? Uh, and so the, we'll get into this a little bit later, but uh, in moving from that, data actually empowers game design in a huge way, and it's, what, it's what's in, like, uh, enabling, um, I don't know, how many steps did you take today? And did you feel good about it? Uh, you know, what's you, what, did you raise your heart rate above a certain level, uh, etc. Those are all based on very simple gaming. Um, but uh, what's the actual question? How gaming experiences my stories on your critical to future product development? Yes. Product. So uh, story, from my point of view, and I'll, I'll bring, I'll, I'll wrap this all up here in a nice, kind of package. Um, story and game design go together like this. They're, they're, they're meshed. Uh, but it's not always the narrative that you're being fed, but that's, that's the story. The story has to involve the person that's using it. Uh, interactive anything uh, has to consider the person interacting and what they bring to the experience. And you have to consider that even uh, if you want to drag them down a very linear path, you still have to uh, consider that person outside, what their feelings are, how they're going to engage uh, to make the product feel full. Um, it's not necessarily in, in, in linear media, but uh, for sure in games it is. So, so what I was going to add on here was that gaming and video gaming and trying to figure out the cross section between the two, experience design and video gaming, or gaming, one is focused on feelings, the other is focused on emotions. And what Chris said when we first started talking about this is turning numbers into feelings from a gaming point of view. From an experience point of view, it's turning story into emotion. So they're really the same thing in essence. And you know, at the at, at the end of all this, we realize that. Well, I'm not gonna tell you. Actually, um, do you have anything to add? <coughs> uh, as far as this one, I, I mean, no. Do, does everybody understand what numbers in the feelings means? Basically, in a digital medium, everything is is defined by number. Uh, how those numbers work. Uh, Produces a certain feeling. So, um, who's played Mario Run or any Mario game? Okay, that's most of them. Okay, if let's say on a scale of one to ten, Mario runs at a speed of six, right, which is equivalent to something like two meters per second, something like that. If I were to go behind the scenes and you didn't even know I was doing it and change that number to a three and he was going half as fast, how would the game feel? It would feel slow. Right? Because your experience tells you that Mario runs as fast, why is he running slow? Right? And that's not a, a, an emotional, like a hard emotional feeling of love, hate, etc. But it's, it's this autonomic feeling that you're going to start to create. That happens at one level. Um, I, I probably won't dive into all of those. There are multiple like psychological levels that you design for. So this was the question that we asked. Is engagement emotionally fulfilling? And, you know, there's so many buzzwords today, and engagement is probably one that you might have crossed in many of your projects or products. And at the end of the day, is it emotionally fulfilling? You might want to jump on this. You know, you, you put this out as like, it could go either way. It doesn't mean it's a success. Is it emotionally fulfilling? Right, and basically this is one of those things that like engagement in digital products these days, and even uh, other you know, forms of interaction with, with companies, is uh, all caring. Right? Do a thing, you get a carrot. Do a thing, you get a reward. Reward, reward. But is it actually emotionally fulfilling? And it's the products that you emotionally attach to that you'll continue to come back to. Uh, this is why you'll hear the other watchword, we need more social, right? It's because it's a heartless product and you need your friends to put some emotion into it, right? Because the, the stickiest retention is social. So, like, I, I, can, I can care less about Nintendo, but if, my, if Kathleen's playing it, I'm like, oh, okay, one more day of, you know, mindless, uh, endless running, or something like that. Right? Oh, look, I got a gold coin. It ceases, it starts to, uh, you start to get a callus, right? Because you get, you're getting the same reward. 
So in looking at experience strategy, experience design from theme parks, and looking at it from a gaming point of view, I asked Chris, so what are sort of the rules around gaming? So maybe you can talk a little bit, and this is where, you know, theory or gaming, what makes something engaging? What makes something fulfilling, especially if you're starting just from here? So I, I, I reference this a little bit. I'll, get in, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a, another thought. It's, it's not, you can't ever look at it as a, a, a 2D problem. It's never just giving people rewards for individual actions. You actually have to build this layer cake of rewards and that appeal to uh, the, your different uh, decision making centers. And so the way I look at video games is actually nested loops, right? So what uh, what is the player, uh, What's the most, uh, so what, like, here, we'll go, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll back it up this way. I map everything to in ego and superego, right? So in is your reflex, survival instinct. Ego is who am I uh, and how powerful am I? And superego is who am I in this world and how am I defined? Um, those decisions don't happen all at the same time. They happen at different time loops for players. It, and when people talk about good gameplay, happens like this. Right? It's actually the stuff that happens by reflex. In fact, you start to get a muscle memory when you're playing games. It's the stuff you don't think about. That stuff all needs to be designed. Right? Not only that, but it then needs to hook into how powerful do I feel. Not only am I getting rewards, am I progressing? Right? Am I getting more powerful in the relative state of what's going on in games? And then super ego is, uh, what's the leaderboard? What's the high score? How is my friend doing? How many levels of Kami Crush did, did, uh, did, did uh, uh, ben, complete. I, I can't believe that he did that because he's not that smart. He must have bought his way through. Right? So the thing is, is these decisions all happen in different time loops, and that's the that's the underpinning of this. But at the top, there's a narrative or an arc, and most people miss this. There's a there's a story arc, but there's also a player arc, right? And by player, you can use player and user interchangeably. I'll say player reflexively, but we're still talking about users. Right? So the user arc, where is it that you want to take them to? Right? If you just go on reflex and design a bunch of activities one after the other without some progression, I think it's repetitious and people get bored. Right? But if there's some promise on the other side, if I wear my Fitbit, I'm going to get yoked. <laughs> right? I'm going to get fit, like, you know, like potato thighs, because yeah. I'm running all the time. Like there's, a, there's a net benefit, but it connects back to the outside world. Right? So if you can take people into your product and back out to the outside world and give them an art in everything that you do, you will have a much more powerful product than you'll ever have by just doing like lead activities. So not only is it So on the experience side, so it, some people have said, what's it take to build a theme park? Has anybody been involved in family entertainment centers or theme parks here in any capacity? Awesome. I can play. Right. So it sometimes is 12 to 15 steps to build a theme park. And that could go three to five years easy and multi millions, even billions. So right now I'm working on a theme park for the BBC in China for two brands, for Top Gear and for Planet Earth. And the concept phase of that alone was nine months, only to move to phase two, which could be two years, only then to move to phase three or four or five or six. And between phases one and six, you had to grow ground. From six to 12, you're dealing with all operations, functions, and you're actually dealing with what it is to build the actual site. And then at the end of the day, it could be empty. It could be a total bomb and a failure. So you really have to plan what those steps are. And it's the same process that Chris is talking about. It's the id, the super ego, the ego. We're not thinking about it in the same way. And also in theme park development, you may not be the governing body from steps 1 to 15. You might have the concept phase and the detailed design or schematics, and then it gets sold to a bunch of different people. So your vision is going to be like the telephone game by the time it gets to live. That happens often. So in, in that idea, um, I'm sure everybody knows this. Chris, you can speak to this. Um, Pirates of the Caribbean. So I used to use this as a game design teaching thing. Also, I'm going to switch sides for a second and go through the pictures. Um, when I was working on Medal of Honor PS1, we had a lot of technical restrictions. Uh, and one of the things that I did was, uh, once we got some other designers on board, was Okay, stop. I want you to write a walkthrough for the whole level of what the player is going to experience, but I want you to design it like Pirates of the Caribbean. The first ride through, you can't see everything. I 
want you to make I want I want you to make sure that there's enough activity in the level that I want to come back and check it out again, uh, right? But the way that this this goes together in the same theories is the ride starts here, right? You know what you're walking into. You start getting expectations. They feel this outside like New Orleans, right? You start to get the feeling of what's going on. They start to you know the architecture changes. You go in and it's more like rock walls made out of fiberglass, etc. Um, and then this whole part is like level design, where basically they filled this with things to look at, and uh, more, like I said, more than you can see in one shot. Um, and then they made it a social experience. Why didn't they put people through in one boat by themselves? Right? It's because they want you to talk to each other while you're on that ride. And so the full experience is designed front to back. Doing this digitally is almost exactly the same. Almost exactly the same, except that this, this happens. Menu screen, first handshake, you know, product, uh, whatever, like the, the crappy ads that you get while you're browsing Facebook. <laughs> so I want to take you on a little bit of a journey here, and the journey is from the 1950s to mid-90s. And what happens between the 50s and the 90s, what happens between the 90s and, let's say, 2000, 2000 to 2010, and 2010 to today. So we're going to take you on that little bit of a journey. So taking a way step back in time, I actually want to spend a little time having you guys read each one of these because it's kind of fascinating. So games, entertainment, and experiences from the 40s to the mid-90s. And you know, obviously in the 50s is when we introduced some technology. In the 40s, you know, it's not part of the mass conversation, but certainly in the 50s, because we've got IBM, we've got you know the beginnings of a blackjack program, but it's really Disneyland and TV happening in the 50s. So you're looking at this now through an entertainment lens, and what happens in the 60s? And within 10 years, Walt Disney dies, and it's 62 years old now. So 52 of those years, Walt hasn't been around, but yet the legacy is exponentially beyond as far as an experience. So in the 60s, um, and, and you know, we're looking at the first you know computer-based video game, obviously landing on the moon. In the 70s, we're still in traditional games, but now we're obviously getting into all arcade style. I certainly lived it. I'm a kid of the 60s, so I can attest to many nights with all of my brothers in arcades. And obviously going into the 80s with EA in its inception, and does anybody know the Power Glove? Has anyone seen the Power Glove? There's a documentary that came out on the Power Glove, if you haven't seen it, it came out last year, it's kind of funny. Um, but Nintendo's attempt at user interaction and the physical, virtual, and how do we have it you know, on our person? So maybe a wearable, a first wearable IMAX cameras in arcades. Um, oh, I thought it was 70s, sorry, uh, 80s. You know, then moving into the well, 80s, I don't know who had, uh, where on here? Do I have, did I miss it? Oh, it was the 70s. What devices or what console devices did you guys have? If anybody had them in the 70s, would you win television, Atari, Odyssey? Was all Atari in this room? No, look at that. I, I think because Mattel put out on television, my parents were going to, they weren't going to buy Atari, so they didn't have in television, but it was like great. Anyway, um, the television. Yeah. I only got, only got to play in Arkansas, the catalog show. Oh, really? <laughs> like that. Yeah. Anyway, the mid-90s, you know, so this is where I sort of drop in. I drop in mid-90s, and I'm thinking now, animator, I'm dropping in mid-90s into PSX, and I'm in a video game company, and what I'm supposed to learn is Wolfenstein to do, and everything that came around with first-person shooters, and I'm supposed to ramp up really quick, and, you know, the history of all of this were experiences I had with my brothers, but I have to say, the thing that hit hard in this era was interactive. So we're going to go from interactive to integrated to immersive. <coughs> That's sort of where we're following. So right now we're in interactive entertainment, mid-90s. And if you guys were part of this moment in time, every studio in LA wanted to be interactive. So everybody had an interactive division. And the, this is such a cheesy slide of icons, but it's exactly what was going on, the feeling of it at the same time. So DreamWorks was funded by Paul Allen and Stephen David and Jeffrey with the idea that Microsoft and Disney folks and NASA JPL guys were all sort of coming together to be this new vision. And Interactive, our division, which by the way wasn't animation, we were on the interactive side, was Steven Spielberg's sort of vision. I know 2D, I'm going to move into 3D, and obviously he has a son who wants to be a game designer, and so DreamWorks Interactive was really one of these big four players at the time, but 
you know, we had EA and Activision as our partners, so at the time, EA was games for gamers. They were not a portfolio company and hadn't bought up everybody yet and really had a different message. And actually, one of the funnier experiences that we had was, I think we were on the cover of PC Gamer or Gaming Month, I don't know, it was Dreamers, created PR craft making games, and it was like, you know, edited by EA. It was like, what? How did that happen? But at this time, and this was such a unique era, and I'm noticing that these are seven-year eras that are happening. So in this period of time, or so, seven plus, um, it was a combination of all interactive, e-commerce, everybody trying to jump in on it. So this was our website at the time. This was our big website, and I sort of laugh at the navigation. Look how interactive time. it is. We were so interactive. It was pretty <laughs> awesome. Um, we were super can proud. Can you go back one slide? So two trivia points. The games that did the, the best for DreamWorks Interactive were the ones where the kid didn't get killed in the first, or get molested, or, or destroyed, or something in the first thing. Right? Yeah, so if you go back and look at the games, you remember so at Jurassic Park, they, yeah. like, they ate the kid, yeah. and like, you know, he caught a dinosaur, and like, all those games that did the best, and like, he didn't get, get chomp on. The other thing, so you mentioned, um, you mentioned the, these time cycles, about six to seven years, is it? Who knows Moore's Law? Does anybody know Moore's Law? Okay, uh, Moore's Law, every 18 months computing power doubles, right? Uh, but at this time, the PSX, uh, so here, we'll hit two things. One, consoles, What's, what was important about consoles at the time is it was static hardware, right? Games, games at the end of the life cycle of a console always get better because everybody squeezes the, 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 the resources for everything they can, um, which is why they only last five to seven years, except for this last generation with Xbox and, and um, uh, PS3, uh, but uh, game design and interactive design, at least at the leading edge like this, is always chasing more law. Always, you're always obsolete when you come out. Um, but that, that's basically you'll see those time cycles. It's actually important. So like if more law is it doubles every 18 months, then in six years you're four times as obsolete, which means it's time to switch, switch consoles, right, or change your mid -spec. One of the things that was great, too, about DreamWorks Interactive is we were able to promote Seamus Blackley from Microsoft, who was the brains behind uh, Flight Sim, and also Xbox. So we didn't really know what we were sitting on at the time, I think, with Xbox, but we were certainly sitting on his, you know, game logic and physics, the inertia modeling, and everything else he put into Jurassic Park. So I remember walking into his office one day, and he had Bill Gates on the phone, and Steven Spielberg walking into his office, and I was like, God, it's got to be love for you, man. It's got to be really bad. Um, but it was a golden era. We were given a lot of money to take a lot of IP and go make magic. And I have to say, that's what Chris was saying, you just spend your whole career trying to get back to that moment in time because we've all learned. And I have to say, today, with VR, AR, and everything else, we're sort of there in a different, in a different way, which is super exciting for those of us that sort of live this moment. So that was our that was our homepage. So these are three titles that both Chris and I worked on. I only worked on Medal of Honor by having the best Rat party ever for a team. I was so low on the totem pole back then as like a localization producer. We got on the space shuttle at the end. Yeah, I said. Oh, so this was my big <laughs> idea. My big idea was when this team actually shipped, that we would get them on the space shuttle at Atlantis to work for a day. So I don't even know how I came up with that idea, but I came up with that idea and I fulfilled on it. I'm not missed it. I know. And I had to get so much clearance. It like, took six months to get clearance for everybody. And there's some funny stories about the guy on there. So there's an Easter egg in there for me about like best rap party ever. <laughs> anyway, um, so I personally was the associate producer on Typhu, which was a game about an uh, ancient tiger waging his war through a tiger waging his war through ancient China, playing different astrological characters as he moves up to fight the dragon at the end. And it's Kung Fu Panda before Kung Fu Panda. Yeah, it's so Kung Fu Panda. And then Chris, you came in on. Yeah, RTS yeah, so for, for, for kids. Yeah, so Microsoft, Activision, EA. So, you know, especially EA, it was all about the Bible, the game design document Bible. I mean, they knew it inside and out, and it was up to us to learn it. We were, you know, DreamWorks. We were a new studio, a Hollywood studio, so we got really hard pressed a lot for not being gamers, true gamers. But now look at how the whole industry has shifted. Because back then, if you were a visual effects or an animator or somebody in Hollywood, you would never think in a million years to work on a video game, ever. That was so low rent. 
And it's so funny to see the entire shift on how gaming and gamification of everything has sort of taken place. But back in the day, there was a horrible stigma around that, which is funny now. I wrote a 500 plus page game design document for, for Medal of Honor, uh, which I'll never do again. Actually, I never have since. Is it uh, I, uh, be I, in, like, the museum. I wish I, I, wish I, like, I need to do like a ninja mission in the EA and like delve the archives <laughs> and like print it. So yeah, so EA bought DreamWorks Interactive, um, but then the team for Medal of Honor spun into Spark Unlimited, and Spark Unlimited I think had a three deal deal with Activision. Yeah, yeah, maybe like also in 2015, the guys that did Metal of Honor Allied Assault, which was PC, spun off and did uh, Infinity War, which you'll all recognize as the guys who did Call of Duty. Uh, Metal of Honor, above and beyond the Call of Duty. Yeah, it's, it's all the same. So. Yeah, so I don't think our team knew back then that we were building a AAA title that was going to have a 20 year legacy that was going to be on the side of every bus going down Santa Monica Boulevard, everywhere in LA, and being in the consciousness as a first-person shooter of World War II game. Um, you, you know, that we had a lot of noise also about the original recipients of the Medal of Honor who actually took issue with this game at first, which was a big thing. <coughs> and do you remember when uh, Stephen and Peter actually had to go? I, so I can tell you exactly what happened with Columbine. <laughs> yes, Columbine had just happened, and that was the biggest issue. So who knew that we were, when you talk about a successful, <coughs> engaging, fulfilling game, and you hit it at a time to market when can't expect the unexpected. That's actually, that's actually a good segue to the outside world and influencing your game because um, we ended up with a better product because of Palmba. Um, because we made it not about gratuitous violence. We made it about you know winning the good fight. There was a mythology that you could lean in on. Um, there was no blood, so it couldn't be about gore. So it wasn't about that type of violence. Uh, what ended up happening is it forced us to creatively think around how do we continue to make the game engaging? And part of that was uh, the animation system, the animation tree, Sunil uh, with his life flower and all, all that stuff. And so, um, because what was the main consideration? What's the audience want? They're probably not going to want like a blood and guts, you know, World War II, uh, John Wayne style, uh, you know, World War II shooter on their PlayStation, which everybody thinks, or at least at that time thought, is for kids, uh, right? So. Uh, yes, there was uh, outside pressure. Nobody admitted it at the time that Columbine had an effect, but it actually ended up having a, um, a really good effect on the product, and it helped us elevate it above just uh, my World War II. So the only other thing I'll say about this slide is, so I was localizing these products abroad. So I was in the UK localizing Typhoo, and I have to tell you, when you talk about story and people looking at this from a marketing lens, so we've both been on the product dev side our entire career, not on the marketing side, but marketing is either half selling you up the river because you're like, hell, we can't even deliver that by the time you need it, or B, you're actually now like, this wasn't my intent. Marketing just has a whole vision. So the wrath of the tiger in the United States. I'm in either Germany or in London. I'm, no, actually, you know what? I, I know exactly where I was. This is hilarious. Activision decided not to go to E3 that year. And they did something called Activate in 98 in Ireland. They took over a castle, and every product that they had, they made the characters come to life in the castle for a weekend. So everybody got tickets to go to this castle for the weekend. Some got to stay in the castle. Others were there during the day doing you know, our product show and tell. And so I was showing this, doing a level, and everybody's laughing. And I'm like, why is everybody laughing? And I turn around and open my head. It says, Typhoon, who are you calling pussy? And I was like, Am I the only girl in this whole room with this sign up on my head right now? <laughs> like, doing this game? I can't even believe it. So nobody had told me this. So PR abroad localizing all these products did not speak to the US on how they were selling these games. So they thought it was a better sell to turn, you know, anyway. There you go. So some other games that we did IP for um, for our movies, Small Soldiers, Dilbert, Dilbert's desktop toys or games. That was that was classic, uh, the Jargonator that Dilbert had on the trigger. Yeah, it was super fun. And then Goosebumps from the license. So these were uh, Microsoft and EA. Um, I can't even say if these were successes, but this was just part of our portfolio. And me having to translate some of this into foreign languages was always a challenge. So Jurassic Park, um, I will say two things about this. One is 
I mentioned before that uh, Seamus Bailey, who had done Flight Sim, was doing, we had three or four Jurassic Park, we had three Jurassic Park games. We had the Kids, Chaos Island, we had uh, Trespasser, which was what Seamus was doing, the PC, and then we had Patrick Gilmore's uh, Lost World Jurassic Park. So we, at the time, we yeah. So localizing that product into Germany, they wouldn't allow any blood. So it's part of the history of Germany, the video games, was they weren't allowing any kind of blood or blood that could be red. So now Jurassic Park in German has got green, spewing green, alien green in all of the games, which is like, come on. So those localization rules actually are part of the, the initial seed for why zombies are so popular in games, because zombies became the, the substitution. Yeah. So you substitute zombies for Germany. Yeah. Side yeah. effect is Texas. And then actually shipping the game into Japan was no 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 we don't want to play we don't want to play the um, T Rex at the end we want to play the T Rex first level you need to redesign the entire game and then once we know we're strong enough to take the T Rex on we'll play all the other small characters so that was a complete redesign and then that game got reimported back to the U S with actually better success rate than it did when we originally made it so you know you never know when you're looking at your products from a product management lens. Uh, but the point to all of this is, so our brands move off the screen and now into arcades. And after this comes game work. So we're in now theme park development, doing <coughs> Dave Buster style games. And so DreamWorks is looking at what your experience is. So we're all challenging that same space at the time. And mind you, at this time, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the neighborhood, uh, between 19, well up to 2001, between 95 and 2001, Disney California Adventure, Universal, every big theme park is building now and opening their doors. So all of this competition about taking your brand into a themed experience. And you know, I'm constantly thinking about this from a PM's point of view. What does this look like and what decisions do you have to make when your brand is going through all of this? So Doug Tenapple, so Clayman. So I actually, he gave me the original Clayman, but this was an entire set made out of clay like the size of this room. But they actually went and did stop motion and filmed this entire video game. And it was so advanced at the time, even though it looked so rudimentary, it was an arcade style type game originally, but the never could. The art of it was the physicality. The art was, this is so amazing, having been somebody on the ground floor with it, was like, you could touch, you could feel it. It was so fascinating to see that everybody should have been behind the scenes. So if you look up Doug Tenapple and look at some of the movies he has from original Claymation, it's pretty awesome. So we also did Skull Monkeys, and uh, Doug's been a creative genius since then. You didn't work on any of these, right? So when I localize this in Japan, Clayman does this. So apparently, I didn't know this in Japan, this is like an F off. And he does this throughout the entire game. And we were met with, they were looking at this like, what are you doing? How could you even think to bring this into Japan? And like, everybody's like, what? What's wrong? Well, the main character is basically flipping off everybody in every scene, you know? And he's like, peace, love. So I don't know if you want to take this off, so, so we just finished now. And so like coming out of that era, it's, it's interesting, with, like we all talked about convergence at that time. And what's interesting here in the, the history piece, actually there's two things. One, uh, uh, like uh, Agile didn't exist, so everything was done waterfall. Um, and it was brute force. And at that time, we talked a lot about, uh, well actually I called it the meat wall, right? Like EA could employ the meat wall. They would just throw money and meat at problems to ship them on time or on the board. Uh, but that, that's, that's part of something that's going on here at this time, which was how do we do more product faster and across different uh, media, right? Uh, but so this convergence, console and PC, uh, video games and movies, movies and TV, it, it's, it was all starting to do this and we all were talking about transmedia companies at that time, right? Which is uh, basically squeezing more from, from a single IP, right? Uh, but the difference between transmedia and the next slide uh, was just basically, uh, actually go back, uh, what, did it, what did I say? Multiple products, different assets, right? So engaging multiple studios to create multiple products and then keep them all in line. Not like, you know, like the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is now where it's all like at a hub and you send it out. Uh, it's more like um, people doing different Right, having different work requirements and different audience outputs uh, with the same IP, and we all stumbled through that terribly at that time because uh, the fidelity on, um, well, Moore's Law caught up with us. We finally got computers powerful enough to use essentially the same assets, which, is the, the, which we'll touch on later. 
So Blu-ray came out in this era, this is Xbox coming out in this era. I mean, in some ways it's a dark period because we're just about to go into obviously the darkest of all. And I don't know who remembers what and where you were during these years, but if you lived through this, it sucked a hundred ways. And the, the irony here is here's the shift, experience design. Now UX is finally getting its, its say, it's finally getting its like, you know, name in the room. And UX is quietly getting like where it is between 2010 and today, in this next seven year cycle, it's all this. Well, it's, everything's integrated, but it's the next slide. But, and Chris is what we're saying about AAA games being changed, but everything is becoming integrated now, right? So it's integrated everything. And the, yeah, and, and the point being that like it's now no longer a barrier to go to multiple screens, right? That's actually expected. And it's uh, usually with the same set of planning on. Um, planning your assets ahead of time so that they can be multi-use. Uh, so the, the philosophy should be quite a bit, uh, but the game did not stay the same. I'll, I'll cover that. But this is the point, and everything became integrated. And this is current to today. So if you really look at this whole list, and as I was writing this slide out myself, I was like, Jesus, I have worked on a project that had to deal with every single one of these at all times. And for you, it was the apps that changed everything. Yeah, so several things happened in games in 2009, 2010. The Apple App Store uh, at Expo, right, and then Android, etc. So the democratizing of game design tools, um, at least is in relation to gaming. So the apps came out of that too, but from my POV, it's all about games. Um, the, uh, so the barrier of entry was reduced to almost nothing. Um, and the uh, method of discovery completely changed. Uh, which totally just completely challenged the AAA um, stranglehold that all the big studios had. Uh, so, which makes game design even more important to have some inkling of understanding at this point in time um, for all of you uh, moving forward. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the things that I pick off this board almost instantly are data visualization, because earlier, remember what I said, if you can score it, you can game it. Right? And if it's an activity that you can figure out how to score, you can game it. So I look at data totally differently than everybody else. Um, I worked at Nexon for a while, which is a, a Korean free play company. Um, you know, it's like that scene in The Matrix where that dude's looking at the code and he says, and he starts calling out what people are. Uh, that's like, I can tell you things about uh, game players at Nexon um, that are actually really, like encroaching or creepy, right? Like, I can tell you their age, where they live, where they are, when they're going to spend money next, etc. When's the right time to hit them with a, a sale? All of that. Uh, but then uh, it gets really, really dark when you combine that with a game designer who knows how to like tap, tap the emotional hook, right? Because then, 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 then you know how to actually, you know, get paid on schedule. Um, but we avoided that, or at least we we're trying to to avoid that because uh, it, it gets it gets a little, a little questionable. Are any, are any of the projects you guys are working on relative to anything up here? Can I just get a show of hands of, is anything that you're currently working on relative to anything that's on this board? Is there anything missing? Virtual reality. Huh? If it's 2010 to today, yeah. virtual and augmented reality should be there. Say it again. Uh, so virtual, are virtual reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're coming to that next. We're coming to this. And the only reason why I didn't put it on there, because 2000. New industry. Well, yes, and, and we'll discuss that next. And it's really because I know we're all in the developer years right now, and there's overlap to all of this. And the big chunk feels right now in this. Everybody, if you go to any companies, everybody's looking at solutions that are all around this. I want a data solution. I want a location-based solution. I want a gamified solution, a mobile, an app, a social. I want a responsive, I want projection mapping or IoT and everything's going to talk. And now people are just talking about VR and AR, except it's not quite market yet. So who really is using it? And we'll get to that. So you're 100% right. And I deliberately <coughs> kept it separate and I was struggling with it, but it makes a little sense because 2020 feels like the tipping point for that. Um, for a lot of for a lot of folks, so perfect timing. So we covered interactive, we covered integrated, and integrated was just that seven-year period with those two, so that one slide. 
And so now we're in immersive. So today to the future. Um, I don't know where we're going. How much time do we have, Katie? Um, about 20 minutes. Okay. Including Q&A? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me take this picture for a second because this is never going to happen. <laughs> People will put a toaster on their face. It's, part of, it's, 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 one, it's one of the barriers to VR right now. Is it, once again, we come back to um, uh, but, like, taking the human uh, experience into account, right? And it's like you can't put it on fast, you can't load it quick, it's not instant, it's not right away, and it's a toaster. So I things. was at the AT&T yeah. Shape event, I don't know if anybody was there, but it was a couple months ago, and if, were, did you, were you lucky enough to get into Catherine Bigelow and what she did? Uh, no, I watched it from the other room. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay, so I was in the room, so Catherine, Catherine Bigelow, she did The Hurt Locker, a bunch of other great movies. She had a six minute video on the Congo on elephant poaching and the rangers that are spending their life, duty, and honor trying to make sure and mitigate this poaching doesn't happen. So she did a VR experience. AT&T and Samsung got involved and they wanted to do the first 500 person sit down same time this exact thing, which we all did. So you sat down with a plastic bag next to your foot and you were instructed like militantly from AT&T how exactly to do this entire process, which you know is totally like, you're just like, oh, this is gonna be a disaster. So, and the irony is, everybody got their you know, gear on. Once, they should have just said, just push this button. But they went into how to actually tighten it on your head, how to control the volume, how to, so, you know, like half the audience, you're about to all have an experience all at the same time, and it's like, disaster. <laughs> yeah, he's totally, totally, totally not to so, but they had a team and the staff to go out and help everybody in the audience that didn't get to like, you know, press play all at the same time. And the irony of that is you've got somebody next to you telling somebody what to do who can't hear, can't understand, and your entire experience is so messed up and you're watching like violent elephant poaching. Yeah. How was it the other room, by the way? <laughs> I mean, it was just like a big screen and we just watched it, watched what they were showing us. Right, but right. It wasn't that interesting, <laughs> but it yeah. was much simpler. Yeah, totally. And the whole idea is, you know, if you haven't heard this once, twice, or a thousand times, the empathy machine and VR is all about empathy and, you know, what do you feel. So actually, wait, well, how many people have experienced VR? So like Oculus plus Touch or Vive or something like that? Okay, so the sense of presence is amazing. I don't want to be there having a sense of presence with whatever's going on on my toaster face with all of you in the room. <laughs> right? So like regardless of whatever that activity is, it's not a social experience, it's a closed experience. Right? right? And that's why I say this will never happen. Or actually, it already did happen. Well, we'll never get a picture. A six minute <laughs> we'll never get like a mass market audience sitting in a room putting toasters on their faces all having the same experience. Although sometime years ago, when I left Disney, went out on my own and I was right at the recession, I was trying to sell experiences that should be group experiences and I went to Sony and I said at this point in time you should be able to take your handheld device and you should be able to have three movie experiences like 300 people in a room playing a game on the screen at once. So it was like game gaming and I understood it. And it was like no one's ever <coughs> going to do this. Nobody's going to champion it in house to Sony much less what really is the end game. But there was a Time Play Interactive that did this in Vegas. So what they did is they actually put it in the seats you were at the Venetian Hotel, you bought a $75 ticket, and you could play poker with a professional poker player who was on the stage playing someone else professionally. You were in the audience playing them, and if you actually won, and it was some kind of lottery system built in, you could actually go down on stage and play poker in a way that you would never get access. And it didn't live very long, it had the hardware and the seats, but I do remember that was the closest thing at the time that was happening, which was kind of cool as an upcharge, but would you pay $75? have to be a hardcore poker player and really love that and do it. So who has tried tilt brush in all of you VR expertise? Okay, so having been a painter and a muralist, tilt brush is to me the one of the better and classic examples of how to get into VR and use VR in an imaginative way. So if you're not using you know live action, if you're not shooting live action and you're not doing CG rendering and you're not creating your experience in VR, Tilt Brush is an amazing phenomenon, and also Epic Games has um, Ghost Paint, I think, which is more graffiti, um, which was at Seagraph this last year, um, which was fantastic too. Um, so, in Walk the World of Immersive, so, does everybody know what all the R's are? So, so VR, AR, MR, Virtual, Augmented, and Mixed. 
our, our real reality. So we're going to actually go far left or far right and then extended reality. So, so we had to define that as, yeah. a, as the opposite yeah. of? Yeah. Well, it was a little bit of like let's look to the spectrum and let's come in at it from different points of view. So, you know, in, uh, in the projects I work on, I'm currently working on an AR uh, project and at the end for Q&A maybe I can show it to you. It's um, spatial mapping guided pathways for the blind. So it's a super cool project, and we're currently in product dev. Um, but in the same vein, you could say it's mixed reality for how you could enhance the space depending on your visual impairment. So we could grow in this, but it's currently slated for ODG glasses. It was built on the HoloLens. It was actually built on the HoloLens emulator. But you know where this could go, we could be looking at this entire arc of you know possibility. So. Um, one of the biggest things in deemed entertainment right now and to sell some of these big pitches is pre-biz or pitch biz even. So pre-visualization in Hollywood using VR is super common. Does anybody have an experience with that? So a lot of big budgets um, want to actually test and you know be risk averse and will test in pre-biz uh, before they spend all of their money. And it's helpful for the actors, it's helpful for obviously you know the directors and everybody else above the line. Um, but pitch biz is sort of a new thing, and when you're pitching projects where a concept phase, that's phase one of 12 phases, is $500,000, you know that the client wants potentially to see this before they actually think about what it could be. And since all these tools are available right now, I spend my life convincing people to spend the ten, twenty thousand dollars in pitch visualization before we lose a $500,000 gig because we couldn't show it. So this is a new area on the pitch side, pre-biz, like Proof um, in Hollywood and a bunch of other folks. You know, this is their day-to-day -day out bread and butter. So, No, it, gaming is still, VR hasn't, hasn't penetrated because there's no market yet. I think a lot of people safely say, well, yes, we're in the developer years and 2020 might make that shift, 2021, 22. So again, we're going to look at a seven year cycle again, I'm sure, and what this evolves to. So in this immersive environment, I've picked what I think are the subjects to watch in immersive entertainment, gaming, but also life. So you can't have this conversation without talking about virtual currency, virtual goods, and um, Chris and I went back and forth because I said, well, Warcraft did it first, but that's not true. But it did. Right, right. I'm splitting hairs. Yeah. <laughs> right. But basically, Warcraft's the one that everybody's going to know. The thing is, there's a fully working virtual economy going on in Warcraft, but it's trivialized because it's a game. You don't think about it that way. But if you go on eBay right now, I guarantee you can find some weird shit. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> people will be selling it. People will be interacting outside of the game. They'll be interacting. Like, um, does anybody know about Chinese gold farms? Okay, so Warcraft, like this virtual economy that happens in here spawned all of these real economy pieces and the most powerful currencies are the ones that can be, um, uh, what, like, I want to say the word converted, but um, yeah, uh, so, so they, they have the most conversion, right? So basically they, they can be converted into other things. That's why the dollar is still so powerful is because it, it can be converted to almost anything. Um, but then, uh, but without Warcraft and Second Life and Ultima Online and the, the exploration of some virtual worlds uh, and virtual economies, there would be there wouldn't be the idea of having Bitcoin, right? Not only that, people wouldn't be adopting Bitcoin without having first been trained in games to, to accept that um, these bits and bytes are real in some way, or connected back to the outside world. So, I don't know if you saw this about six days ago. So, DeepMind's Go Playing AI doesn't need human help anymore to beat, uh, I can't read it from over here, doesn't, it doesn't need human help to beat us anymore. So, this idea of this mass super intelligence that, that's happening, and of course, singularity, and where we're going with machine learning, AI, and robotics. I just came, before I came here, I was at the Canadian Consulate's Tech Innovation Roundtable, and I was asked to, uh, be a, I don't know, mentor for pitches. And it was all females that were pitching all new startups. And all of them were in the vein of all these immersive technologies. So the woman that pitched AI to me, what she said was, our bots get paid. That was our, her opening line, which 
the whole entire pitch, I was waiting to see a visual of a bot getting paid. I was like, what does that look like? Is that like an avatar that you can see a dashboard getting paid while it's busy supercomputing everything in the world? Yeah, I was like, what does that look like? So you're gonna, you need to gamify that? So she never got to it. She completely, the whole deck was all about the data and everything that it does, but I was still stuck on that idea. But it was so in line with, these are new startups, and what's the visual for that? So we can even understand and comprehend the depth of what all of this super connectivity and mass computing is doing. So between AR, VR, MR, XRR, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, virtual goods, and machine learning, AI, and robotics, you know, it begs a really big question, which is what's the next 25 years going to look like? And we're sitting in this exponential growth. I don't know if you want to take a little here before I go into the five ways how, but it's so obvious to me right now. And this was from uh, Peter Diamandis' both books, Abundance and Bold, that just came out. Um, I added uh, a couple things there, but but that's the net net. So the only thing that I can come from here is that like, your attention is going to be split in a million ways. Um, and without a, 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 so game design isn't actually having the right way to do something at all times. It's actually a set of problem solving tools. Um, and I'll, I'll, I, there's a, it's not on the slide here, but I've got whiteboard markers. I'll put a couple of things up here. There's only like three things I teach all my students, and I'll talk about them. Um, but you need some way to organize uh, new technology coming into your design skills or your product in a way that's going to be um, that's going to integrate well. Uh, and it's really easy to jump onto new technology. And go, oh my God, this is going to be the thing. We're going to make it all about this, and you go there, and then you forget the most important thing, which is users or players, uh, how they're going to connect with your project, uh, et cetera. And so that, that's that's where I'll, I'll wrap this up at the end with some game design stuff. Go ahead. The OG. The OG. That's all bullshit. <laughs> so, so you've probably seen this. I just It's a crappy slide, but it says a lot, which is everybody's current investment in where we're going next. So the next 25 years are going to be ridiculously exponential with all of those technologies of machine learning, AI, robotics, VR, AR, cryptocurrencies. So I was, um, about a month ago, I met a gentleman named David Lee who was the head of the Open Innovation Network in Shenzhen. And the Shenzhen speed is what, are, are, is everybody familiar here about Shenzhen in China and, and this newly built city from 39 years ago and the intent of the city? I just learned this myself. So Shenzhen in China, huh? Is it the master planned community where you can walk everywhere? Yes, okay. it's a combination of that and just the innovation. So Shenzhen in China owns 80% of the manufacturing of every technology that we use. And this was a designated city in China 39 years ago. I could be bastardizing some of this story, but on the net net, it's like 39 years ago, we're gonna deem this town the new innovation city. And this generation of sort of cultural, growing up in cultural exchange, they're gonna fill, you know, throw so much money at the speed of which Shenzhen can turn stuff around. So if you take a product to the UK, you take a product to the US, you take a product to Shenzhen, Shenzhen will win every time, and it does not mean quality lacks. It's quality and speed and innovation. It's sort of a dream come true if you're total, like, you know, I don't know if it's a dream come true. Yeah, it's a dream come true for me in a lot of ways of, like, what's possible. Like, it's all golf courses. So, <laughs> like it's all golfers. So, so, David Lee, who's the director of the Open Shenzhen Innovation Lab, they're currently mapping every inch of the ocean floor. And the reason why it's germane and this whole talk is germane is like, so we've mapped the entire floor, we can change the weather, we know everything about what's technically here, and now we're giving up AI to supercomputing, and we're gonna have some singularity that's happening, some technological singularity with this knowing of this AI, and it's all gamified, and here are all the players that are now saying, well, we've done it all here, let's figure out what somewhere else looks like. So this space race is so real, and you know, you read about it and you're like, okay, all these people are investing all this money in the space race. I don't know if you want to jump on for any of the slides, but I mean, yeah. It's no joke. So those are all the folks investing money that have super powerful companies sitting behind them. On the experience design side, I got a call, a, I don't know, maybe six or eight months ago about Mars World. I was like, is this a theme park? 
this is a bunch of NASA guys who have been on this for 35, 40 years, who are about testing, beta testing colonization. And they're doing it in a theme park environment. And so are all these other folks. And if you look any of these up, HP and NVIDIA showcased a whole beta test for the future of farming and robotics and how you live in zero gravity and how real is this? So it's really no joke and I kind of look at this like, well this is all, you call games, isn't it? It's everything that we've been doing for the last 22 years in games that has affected everything. And so now it's life. Yeah, it's 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 really uh, nerving for me because a lot of uh, the things that I thought were secrets of game design are actually exposing themselves in lots of strange ways. Um, but uh, I think the thought process to get through it is is uh, it's important to take into account that it doesn't happen automatically. Or uh, you should question every pattern, uh, every design pattern, every design pattern is in question. So I think in essence, this is our last slide, but this is, this is sort of the point. Bringing it all together is we're in real life. Real life is gamified. We're in a mixed reality environment. What's real, what's not? Everybody's trying to design it for engagement. Is engagement fulfilling? Do we care about it? And what does that mean to not our kids, but our kids' kids? Because that's really where the impact's gonna hit. So with that, I think it's thank you.